I love introductions to songs that I'm thinking, what is she playing? I love that. I, I love this. You, you're noticing it too with a closer eye. And, and, and we've talked about this with, with some of the um, uh, pre, or, uh, actually the beginning, the prelude to a hymn that Jenny often plays that we all wonder, where is this going? And then all of a sudden there it is. So thank you so much for being with us today and next week as well. Um, many have asked on the way in, the time in Minneapolis was awesome. Um, my granddaughter is growing, which is a wonderful thing. Um, I, I, you might remember that I told you she was having difficulty eating, that she was only drinking like two ounces at a time, and then she would fall asleep as you were feeding her and she wouldn't finish. Um, the speech therapist noted that, yes, a speech therapist, they're the people that look at this now, she noticed that when she was feeding that her lower jaw would drop. And so she'd disengage from the bottle and fall asleep. So for a while, as they were holding the bottle, they had to take their little finger and hold her jaw up. And so she'd stay engaged. Now she's drinking an entire bottle and minutes later, she'll be screaming for more. So it's a wonderful thing. And she's up to 10 pounds, uh, four ounces, which is fantastic. And we talked about politics and she advised me on who to vote for, um, which was very good. We've had some good conversations, this three month old and I, so um, more on that later. Um, it's good to be here. We, two more weeks, including today about bread. Um, <laughs> Preachers everywhere are just responded, thanks be to God, I think. I heard that somewhere. Um, but this one, this text today is an interesting and somewhat troubling text, too. And we'll get to that in a few minutes as well. We begin our worship today with the opening sentences, and I invite you to stand as you are able. As we enter into this sacred place, put away the pressures of the world that ask us to perform, to take up masks, to put on brave fronts. Silence the voices that ask you to be perfect. This is a community of compassion and welcoming. We bring all that we are and all that we yet can be to this safe place, holy place. We have gathered in this sacred place again May we continue to create here a circle of love, ever expanding, ever growing. A place of wisdom, a place of connection, a place of hope. Amen. Our opening hymn is O Living Bread from Heaven.
love leads us to new experiences. Help us to be open to your presence among us and within. Let us sense your glory in the sights and sounds of this day. May it be so. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading for today is from Proverbs, the ninth chapter. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her animals. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servant girls. She calls from the highest places in the town. You that are simple, turn in here. To those without sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We join in reading responsively by a whole verse, passages from Psalm 34. Fear the Lord, you saints of the Lord, for those who fear the Lord lack nothing. Come, children, and listen to me. I will teach you reverence for the Lord. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from lying words. The second reading for today is from Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Word of God, word of life. I invite you to stand as you are able for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to John, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. On my long drive back home last week from Minneapolis, I had a lot of time to ponder. <laughs> I pondered retiring. I'm of age after all. I'm in that range now where it's perfectly acceptable for me to think about that. I would like to spend more time with my family who live five and a half hours in opposite directions of where I live. I was annoyed by the enormous amount of traffic on my way home that caused that five and a half hour drive to be six and a half hours, literally 20 miles an hour on the freeway for an hour. It was an incredible thing. And this isn't a new notion in my head. 
to think about retiring. I've been thinking about it for a long time, but this was an extended time. And while all those reasons that I just mentioned are in and of themselves just good reason to think about retiring, none of them was the real driving force that day as to why I was thinking about retiring. When I woke up last Sunday morning, I guess it's habit, I immediately looked up online, had to find the scripture readings for today, even though I wasn't preaching, still do that every Sunday morning, and I read this passage. I knew in the back of my head this text was coming, kind of hoping it would be last week so that I would kind of be able to avoid it. I mean, there have been years, you know, where this text come up every three years that I have done sermon series instead of talking about bread for five weeks. But I really didn't want to see this text, that this would be the text, the text that might drive me to retiring. I don't like this text at all. I dread it every three years. There are these statements about bread that Jesus makes this week are troubling. They're strange. They're really grotesque as well. Eating and his body and drinking his blood. I mean, if that doesn't have a serious yuck fast factor to it, I don't know what does. I mean, it's not just gross. I mean, when you, you think about the crowd that's listening to Jesus initially, they have heard from the Torah. And the Torah strictly forbids people from eating meat that still has blood in it. They know that you're not supposed to do this. Not just set aside for a second, it's eating of another human. Doesn't matter that it's an animal, you still can't do that. So I got that in the back of my head. Then also, I know this, that scholars have said this, that especially in the early church, there was great controversy that, reigned, that raged, not just on these sayings of Jesus, but also the value, the importance of the Last Supper at all, and whether it was something that we needed to replicate. So you got all of this stuff going on in my head, and of course that ick factor too, that just was there. So this week I thought, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> I gotta do it. I gotta preach on this text. And so I looked for some inspiration, and it took me a long time, but I needed something. I needed something to give me a little support, to ease my uneasiness, to give me something. And I found it in a reflection by Dr. David Lose, and he wrote this. As I plotted through the work of different scholars, ranging from Augustine and Luther to some of my very own professors and colleagues, there welled up inside of me a mighty complaint. So what? I wanted to scream with each new twist in the scholarly debate, so what? What does this talk of flesh and blood and heavenly bread and even with the Lord's Supper really have to do with the ins and outs, the ups and downs of everyday living? What does it have to do with the things that really matter? Our hopes and our dreams, our loves and our hates, our living and our dying. What does it have to do with us here and now, 2,000 years later, struggling just to make ends meet? Yeah. So what? So what? If anything, Dr. Lowe's brought me from where I was to really the heart of this struggle over this text. So what? And remember, a different form of this question is kind of at the heart of our small catechism that Luther wrote. He writes, what does this mean? 
A modern translation of that is, so what? You know, you look at each commandment. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, all of that. So what? So what does that really mean? As much as I love exploring the theological insights and issues and problems that arise in the scriptures, and I do love following the rabbit trails that that takes me down, I wasn't really thinking about, so what? And what is the answer to that? In the search of our own daily lives, looking for meaning in our lives, this abstract, nonsensical talk about eating and drinking Jesus' flesh is just not helpful to me. I feel as I'm in that crowd of people who are thinking out loud when Jesus says this, what? What is he? What? What, is it? what does he mean by that? Is there something else there? And of course, recoiling at the whole notion of eating anyone's flesh. Surely he means something else. Something else other than actually eating his flesh and drinking his blood. I mean, if that's the case, then what is he really trying to say? I imagine this crowd who has been pressing in on him constantly and following him wherever he goes, suddenly just stopping and you know, taking a bit of a step back and wondering, what? What is he saying here? And then realize he's not joking. He doesn't mean anything else. He means what he says that he's willing to give up his very life so that we would live. Wow. Imagine hearing that for the first time. After everything that he's been saying, you hear that for the first time. That's a wow moment. Not necessarily a good wow, a confused wow, a wondering wow, a scared wow. A wow that may make you not just take a little step back. It might make you throw up your arms and go, nope, and walk away from it. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Yikes. You have no life in you. You're just a drone wandering this planet. You're nothing. What is this life we can't have unless we eat and drink? I guess I'm, as much as I want to be done pondering the question, so what? I can't run away from it. Maybe these words are a reminder that God comes to us every day, in every situation, in our struggles and in our joys, in our laughter and in our tears. Maybe it's a reminder of what happens up here at the table and when we kneel here at the railing, that we are reminded of the sacrifice, that we're reminded that this is a God who will go to extremes for me, who'll go to extremes for each of us. Maybe it's a reminder of the commonality we share when we gather here that Jesus meets us here in this sharing of his flesh and his blood, that we have the support that we need for the difficult and joyful world that we live in. Maybe it's a reminder that the struggles we have are not our struggles alone, that we share those with one another. There's a lot to think about here. While I may be uncomfortable with this language that Jesus uses, I wonder too, am I also uncomfortable when Jesus tells us 
to go visit the sick and imprisoned and to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and all of that. Because honestly, yeah, that makes me uncomfortable at times too. So why shouldn't this make me uncomfortable as well and make me ponder and make me wonder? Wonder what it's all about. So what? I guess I'm not done yet. I guess I'm not ready to retire just yet. It's getting close, but I'm not, not yet, because it feels like there's so much yet that I need to do. What it is, I don't know, but I'll figure that out with God's help as well. So come, come to the table with your very self for who you are right now in this moment, with what you need, what you think you need, and what you really need, with your joys and your fears and your tiredness and everything that makes up who you are. And come to this meal, this meal where there is always a place at the table for you and I to eat and to drink, however you need to understand what that means and what Jesus says. That's what what is what. Thanks be to God. Amen. There is really only one hymn that we could sing for the hymn of the day today. So we join in singing, I am the bread of life. I invite you to stand as you are able.
Together, let us join in an affirmation of faith. In response to the word reflected on, let us share together this affirmation of faith. We believe we are here because of the eternal generosity of that holy lover whom we call God. Because God is, there is a universe. Galaxy, sun, moon, and Because God is, Because God is, because God is, because God is. Because God is. We believe in God, whose nature is creativity, shaping our lives and the lives of our neighbors, luring us all to live life generously and compassionately. I was reminded in the middle of that of the author of our liturgy for today, Rex Hunt, who is from Australia. That explains the wallabies <laughs> in the middle of our affirmation. Calling on the spirit of wisdom to guide our hearts and our minds, let us pray for the church, for the world, and for all who are in need. We pray for those caught in the midst of warfare and conflict, especially in Gaza, Israel, Lebanon, Iran, Iraq, Myanmar, Haiti, Russia, Ukraine, Burkina Faso, Sudan, and South Sudan. Merciful God. For all who are in the beginning and middle of recovery from Hurricane Ernesto, Merciful God. For those affected by wildfires in Greece and in California and other places in our country, merciful God. For safety following the earthquake felt in Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon, merciful God. For victims of stabbings in England and Turkey, merciful God. For those grieving plane crash victims in Sao Paulo, Brazil, merciful God. For the United States and other countries preparing for government elections, merciful God. For those beginning or preparing for a new school year, merciful God. For the protection of creation, wildlife, water, and other resources, merciful God. We lift up these prayers to you, gracious God. Receive them into your holy keeping. Amen. Let us take a moment to celebrate each other and be reconciled to each other. May a heart of peace rest upon you. Let us share that peace. You may be seated as we receive our morning offering and join in singing as the grains of wheat. As the grains of wheat.
become part of the greater world. The smallest giving can be an expression of the good spirit of generosity and care. May we be helped to carry through the doorway of each new day this good spirit of generosity and care. Amen. Members of the Jesus movements regularly ate a meal together when they met as a community. It was a characteristic that they had in common with virtually every other social group in the world. It was considered primary to the early developments in the movement's meal liturgy. These meal traditions were not about personal salvation or payment for sin. Instead, they were about actions and offering of hospitality, social identity, and being in solidarity with those around us. The liturgical movement centered on celebration, presence, and joy. I invite you into the spirit of those meals. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give thanks and praise for all that is good in the world, for that mystery we name Jesus, for the sage we name Jesus, for the renewing strength and freedom of the Spirit. God of summer, we offer you praise. God of lightning, wind, and storm, we offer thanks. God of hot summer days, of green lawns and blooming summer, of gardens growing food for our tables, and days of festivals and reunions with family and friends, we open ourselves to all the possibilities life offers us. We remember the time when Jesus faced difficult decisions and destructive forces in the days and nights of his searching, in finding ways to free others from images and ideas that kept them captive and dependent on and fearful of God in breaking down social and religious barriers, in facing failure, in facing death. When we experience the hunger of our lives, may we find the courage to let go and trust in your guiding, warming light. As we eat together at this table, we remember the importance and the words and the actions of all meals in the tradition of Jesus. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his friends. He poured a cup of wine, offered thanks for it, and gave it also to his friends, broken and poured for everyone. Everyone is welcome to be here. In this way, we lift up a world of inclusion where all people live with respect and dignity. Everyone present will receive a share. In this way, we lift up a world of generosity where, as in the examples of Jesus, abundance overcomes scarcity, so all are fed. Everyone is invited now to take a portion and to see others also receive. In this way, we lift up a world of sufficiency where entrenched systems of privilege are challenged Wealth is shared equally, and all are satisfied with enough. The disciple came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he taught them, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So in the meal tradition of Jesus, we break and share bread and drink wine, pledging ourselves to allow the spirit that moved in Jesus to move freely in our lives as well. Come, there is a place for you, and all is ready.
Let us take on this week's life with renewed hope and imagination. Go in peace. Hold in your heart the certainty that the spirit of life is always with you. When our hearts are torn asunder or when we soar with sweet joy, we are never alone, never apart from the spirit that resides within us, that guides our lives and cherishes us always. As the sun in its shining brings glory, as the stars of the night scatter dark, and the moon gives us hope in its radiance, so may the light of God fill your heart and your mind and your life. Amen. May it be so. Just a reminder this morning to put it on your calendar that coming up very soon is God's Work Our Hands Saturday, where we will be packing um, some emergency kits for our friends at the night ministry. Um, hope you all can come. Mary, is it September 8th? 7th. I was off by a day. My memory's not as good. Saturday the 7th, okay? So hope you all can. Two to four. See, you should have given an announcement this morning. You have all the right information. <laughs> when I rely on my memory, not such a good thing. Anyway, our closing song for today is We Praise You, O God. I invite you to stand as you are able. Thanks be to God.